Aliyah watched men and women setting up tents and vendor stalls, filling the field with a chorus of voices. The young elf smiled under his hood, realizing how much fun the evening celebrations can be with such an abundance of food and drinks. Someone almost hit him, but the nimble elf swiftly stepped aside, letting a bulky man pass with his heavy load of crates, filled to the brim with various goods. Being a bard, Alaya loved to visit other cities, and especially so during feasts, festivals, and jousting tournaments. He never stopped in one place for too long, finding the excitement of the road ahead more invigorating than the sad existence of a bard stuck in one place under the employ of some rich lord or lady. The elf headed towards the jousting ground, already knowing how much fun he would have and how many new songs he would be able to write when the jousting had concluded. But before the tournament was due to start, Aliyah had to check the seats and grounds for a perfect place to see everything. He always searched for a good seat or corner, where he would see the festivities among the people, though. He was an elf. He wasn't very tall. And this was more of a bother in his life. Firstly, he was never taken seriously, as he looked much younger than he was. And secondly, no one really believed he was a purebred elf which sometimes led to confrontations with tavern brawlers. Fortunately, he managed to avoid most confrontations, either by running or losing his pursuers in the crowd. At the moment, as he was glancing about the fantastic jousting grounds, he noticed a very thin, almost starved girl. She looked about 15 years of age, already had a number of scars on her arms and face, as if she wasn't treated well since early childhood. She wasn't bothering the people who were finishing up preparations, hanging the flags and flowers and brushing away the dust and dirt from benches and stages. Instead, she was just watching the birds flying about over her head. It was a strange sight for such a place. If someone wasn't working, they usually went away to get some rest elsewhere. And this girl was openly slacking off and no one even approached her. Aliyah was intrigued so he headed to the girl to ask her if she would help him and be his guide. Perhaps she would be able to tell him which tavern or inn might still have a place to spend the night. As he approached her, he noticed that she didn't even look at him, too deep in her thoughts. He studied her face and realized that if not for the scar running across her lips and cheek, she would have been a very beautiful young woman. Excuse me, Elia called out and the girl flinched glancing at him with a surprised look in her golden eyes. For a second, the elf even forgot what he wanted to ask her, lost in the captivating beauty of her gaze. Hi, might I bother you for a couple of minutes? Perhaps you can help me. The girl glanced around and frowned. Why are you talking to me? You seem to be the nicest person who's not busy, Elias smiled, charmed by her beautiful eyes. You're not from around here, are you? The girl sighed. You shouldn't be talking to a cursed one. Aliyah tilted his head, unfamiliar by anything of the sort. Cursed one? I'm a daughter of a necromancer. I'm a cursed one, so don't speak to me, unless you want to be cursed as well. The girl waved aside, and when Aliyah looked that way, he noticed a couple of servants whispering, watching him speaking to the girl. Then why are you staying in this sorry excuse for a city? The elf smiled. The girl chuckled, then burst out laughing. She took her time calming down before answering. And where would I go, elf? At least here I can steal enough food, because people ignore me most of the time and don't want to do anything with me. Anywhere. There are so many places where no one would even know who you are. For a moment the girl froze, as if thinking about his words, then smiled. True, but I'd have to get there somehow, and I don't have any money. So, I'm a bard. We rarely have coin in our purse. Aliyah took his lute and ran his long fingers over the strings, making a short toot but it never stops me from traveling. You're an interesting young elf. Let's make a deal. You help me find a place to rest my weary head for a few nights, and when the tournament is over, you can come with me and I'll take you anywhere you want. Aliyah bowed to her. Allow me to introduce myself. Aliyah Nightingale. You can call me Ellie. Ethel, the girl nodded in return. Well, Ethel, how about it? Will you be my guide in this foul place? The girl chuckled and agreed. For the next few days, she showed him all around the city and entertained him with the stories he wouldn't have heard if not for the shunned girl, who was able to hear and see some things no one else would. Surprisingly, she was fun to be around, and he learned that she wasn't as easy as she seemed at first glance. 
By the time the tournament was over and they set out on the road, Elia already knew how she became the one who was never spoken to and ignored by all the townsfolk. To him, it was a pure strike of luck, since he found much more than he bargained for. Ethel became an inspiration for a saga he began writing, and though they agreed to be comrades for a short time, they soon became close friends, united in a strange weave of fate. They became the two traveling bards, most famous for a very sad and heart-moving saga that was known all across the many kingdoms they have traveled to. When a new planet was discovered, only a few people could grasp the significance of how relevant it would become to the human race. The first drones that sent back initial readings to one of the space stations close to Earth made a great difference in supplying the scientists with enough information about the planet that was called Hypatia. For decades, people have been flying into space either for scientific research or for simple tourism. But ever since Hypatia was discovered, it became more than just another set of coordinates. The planet's atmosphere consisted of the exact same components as Earth's, but with slightly higher levels of oxygen. As the data was processed, the scientists realized that there were no toxins or any radiation that could prevent humans from settling there. So the impression was that Hypatia was, in fact, compatible with human life. Further investigation and scans revealed even more. Though there were plants and animals on Hypatia, there weren't any signs of sentient life forms, so the planet was soon approved for colonization. The project was costly. But as the first few spaceships set off, the International Space Exploration Association organized worldwide crowdfunding to gather the necessary funds for the gargantuan project of the future colony. The first stage of the project began as the scientists and engineers arrived on Hypatia to start the construction of a tiny research center. From there, the facility quickly grew into a small settlement, which began accepting more and more people who came to the planet for various reasons. Even though most of the people there worked in different scientific fields, there were a few who came because of excessively large sums they invested in the Hypatia colony. Amongst them was a bored and rich middle-aged gentleman who decided to relocate far away from Earth for the sole purpose of being one of the first pioneers to catalog the planet's variety of life and the beauty it offered. He was a nature enthusiast and often helped out the biologists in their expeditions, taking upon himself a role of an assistant and pilot. He didn't mind being called a space tourist by the scientists, as in his core he was exactly that, a tourist wishing to experience something new and unheard of. Another person whom the first settlers received to their growing team was a writer, who became somewhat of a nuisance to most, but still loved for her cheerful personality and open mind when it came to helping the others with making notes and capturing videos on her camera. This young woman, sent by a wealthy international news company, was excited to be the first reporter and archivist on Hypatia. As years passed and the colony grew, receiving even more settlers that began creating a closed ecosystem of their highly protected dome, Hypatia, was barely explored, though expeditions were held frequently. But as it went, more and more space tourists arrived some of them leaving after spending only a few months. To the bored gentleman, who spent a lot of money to secure his place among the first settlers, people like those seemed strange. If they could spend such an unbelievable amount of funds solely to see a new world and return to Earth, what were they looking for at all in their lives? Hypatia became a new home for the man, slowly growing on him with its vast possibilities and prospects he could explore. With each passing year, he became more and more invested in creating a perfect colony for others to call home. Eventually, he even converted all his earthly funds into credits with the IC Corp to begin constructing a separate dome for tourists alone, as he could understand very well how distracting those were to the scientists who worked in the initially built research facility. Though not all of them agreed with his method, many others eventually became quite pleased with the fact that he hired and paid for some people to be brought in to work at his little tourist hotel, as he called his new establishment, honoring the nickname he was given by the scientists when he first arrived on the planet, and when he began running his place for the rich and powerful, who were never engaged in really helping the people on Hypatia, the scientists found respect for the man and his help with the tourists that visited every now and again but still they called him a tourist, adding that he was the first tourist. 
and over time it became the new nickname that kept him smiling among the friends he found in the colony. Years passed by and his business grew, bringing more and more tourists to Hypatia, which allowed the IC Corp to continue building their colony. He helped open a mining operation on the planet, which made it easier for the colonists to build various machines and transportation, and aided with the multi-level greenhouses that produced food for the colonists while the scientists were figuring out which local foods could be consumed safely. Eventually, he turned into a colonist, settling down with the very same woman reporter, which never left Hypatia, falling in love with the colorful nature of the planet. They both worked hard to build their colony, finding it easier to love the planet for what it had to offer. They became one of the first families in the colony, helping other people to settle down or have a pleasant space vacation. But no matter how many other tourists came to Hypatia, the man was still called the first tourist by everyone. Sometimes in life, things happen for a reason, good or bad. It's all a matter of your own perspective 